Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com as we begin to wind down our expository study of the book of Revelation. We're in the final chapter, and in this study we'll take a close look at verse 17 of Revelation chapter 22, breaking it down phrase by phrase in a study titled, Whosoever Will. You can send comments, questions, or prayer requests by email to bbbfohio at yahoo.com, or you can send your letter to Bible Believers Fellowship, P.O. Box 211, West Jefferson, Ohio, 43162. That's P.O. Box 211, 211, West Jefferson, Ohio, 43162. And now we begin our study of Revelation chapter 22, titled, Whosoever Will. This is part one of two. Revelation 22, 17. And we'll open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for everyone who is here. Thankful for the great fellowship. Thankful for this building. Keep us warm. Keep us safe from the wind and uh, the rains and everything. And we just don't take it for granted, Lord. We're just so, so thankful for the way you provided. Thankful for all who are watching online. And we'll see this online later or uh, however they see or hear it. We're just thankful for the opportunity to study your word and to get the word out. As the time is short, we believe you are coming soon to take your bride. Lord, we pray you find us, all of us, busy when you return, when you rapture us out of here. And help us as we study with your Holy Spirit being our guide and our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before getting into our study, <clears throat> we want to give you the latest fairy tale for grown-ups. Of course, we have a song by that title as well. But uh, what the Bible calls science falsely so-called. Um, this was hot off the press here today. On uh, This is from the Washington Post, but this has been reported all over the world. How many of you saw the report of the planets they found and all that? We did a video on that, but tonight we're going to talk about it here. New found 3.77 billion year old fossils could be earliest evidence of life on Earth. Yes, could be. <laughs> These are called hematite tubes. See them there? They're actually under a microscope because in reality they're thinner than a human hair. But that's what they look like. Hematite tubes is what they're called. They're being hailed as the oldest fossils ever found. Think of that. Remember that. Remember that as we continue. Doesn't it look like they discovered a delicious dish of pina e pasta? Yeah. I'm thinking somebody pulled a you know fast one on there. What is that? You got punked, they say? That's what it looks like to me. So let's look at how scientific this claim is. Is this factual? And this is, I'm just showing you, this is how you should read the news. Is it based upon any observed, demonstrable, falsifiable, concrete proof using the, what we know as the scientific method? That's what you should be asking. What are they basing this on? Well, these are quotes taken directly from the story, and that's what it ought to be called, a story. Published by the Washington Post, it should begin with the words, once upon a time. <laughs> but it doesn't. They say these newfound microfossils are the oldest fossils ever found and could be earliest evidence of life on Earth. Now watch this as we continue reading. You're going to see that it, these are words of fiction and faith. They're intermixed. Some are just words of fiction. Others are words of faith, meaning that they believe something. They don't have any proof for it. They just believe it. See what I'm saying? They present it as though it's a fact in the headline. Tiny tubular structures uncovered in ancient Canadian rocks. Eh? Could, 
could be, there it is again, could be remnants of some of the earliest life on earth, scientists say. The straw-shaped microfossils, narrower than the width of a human hair and invisible to the naked eye. This is, sounded very much like our once upon a time uh, there was nothing mm -hmm. video. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now look at this. Are believed to come from ancient microbes. Based on what? Your grandmother's mustache, as Peter Ruckman would say. <laughs> There's no basis for what you're reading. We're just reading and this is presented as science. Scientists debate the age of the specimens, but the author's youngest estimate, 3.77 billion years, would make these fossils the oldest, would, would make these fossils the oldest ever found if it was based on something more than the author's estimate. That's a great question. There's no evidence of any evidence. Continue. Any signs of life in the rocks that do survive are difficult to distinguish, let alone prove. <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy. I was reading this, I'm thinking, this is hilarious. It's sad, but it's hilarious. Uh, continuing, other researchers in the field express skepticism. Those would be scientists. <laughs> the real scientists, you know, are like, wait a minute now. About whether the structures were really fossils. See, they're saying, what? We don't even know if these are fossils, let alone 3.77 billion year old fossils. So they really could be pita pasta instead of fossils. I'm just saying, you know, scientifically speaking. <laughs> That's spaghetti sauce. Your mother's made this dish before. <laughs> you have eaten this before. Yeah. Little, little pieces. This is Parmesan. There. <laughs> All right, we're almost done, but it's too much fun. i got to go in a little bit. But the scientists behind the new finding believe their analysis should hold up to scrutiny. <laughs> I believe I can fly. Believe. That's not science, folks. I'm sorry. That's just not science. It's something, but it's not science. In addition to structures that look like fossil microbes, the rocks contain a cocktail of <laughs> chemical compounds. So now they're having a cocktail with their penne pasta. <laughs> Bottoms up. In addition to structures that look like fossil microbes, I'm quoting scientists, by the way. I'm not making this up. The rocks contain a cocktail of chemical compounds they say is almost certainly the result of biological processes. How many of you know hearsay is really good science? You know that? That's what I, that's what I hear. I'm coming to the ear. Yes, that's what I hear. If their results are confirmed, <laughs> they will establish science? No, they will boost a belief that organisms arose very early in the history of Earth and may may find it just as easy to there you go you look deep enough you find the whole point evolve on worlds beyond our own see when that you see these stories about nasa and they're talking about all these planets and everything it's driven by what jesus told us in john 3 19. men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil and there have been some of them, even during scientific debates, admit they really don't have a lot of science, but they don't want the intelligent design slash creationist argument getting in the way of their sex life. And if you don't think that's true, I can provide you. I'm, one of these days I will. We're going to do some studies on this 
in the future I'll show you the quotes from scientists who will tell you that. They admit it. The process to kickstart life. No, life wasn't created. It was... <laughs> the process to kickstart life may not need a significant length of time or special chemistry, but could actually be relatively simple process to get started. If you know what those words mean, you know how stupid that comment is. <laughs> Said Matthew Dodd, a book smart idiot, biochemist at University College London, and the lead author on the paper. Geo. Oh, he's a geo, yes, biogeochemist. Bio Not only do they make up their science, but they make up the names of their jobs. <laughs> And there you have it. It's not about science, it's about creating proof, in quotes, for an agnostic religious belief system. And I'm telling you, if you read and scrutinize what you're seeing, how many of you saw Bill Nye on Tucker Carlson the other day? And Tucker just kept asking him the same question, wanting an answer, and couldn't get it. And that's what you'll see from these guys. They don't deal in science. Bill Nye is not a science guy. I think his, what was his, he didn't go to college to be a science, it was, his, he has a, he a business degree or, yeah, huh? yeah, he's an engineer, but he's not a scientist in the sense that we think of when we think of a science guy. So anyway, that's going to segue into our study, Whosoever Will, Revelation 22, 17, and uh, got a picture there of the nail scarred hands wide open. The message of the gospel is to whosoever will. These guys we just read from, these scientists, are the whosoever wants. And it doesn't have anything to do with election and Calvinism. God did not predestinate these scientists to be stupid. They chose that. And uh, verse 17 is the only verse we're going to read in our study because it's so thick. I want to read this with you. Read it. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Amen. Amen. So we begin by noting the Bride. And I just want to give you, as we begin this study, you see an example of people refusing to believe the plain teaching of the Scripture. And folks, let me tell you something. When, when people start to sell you something that sounds compl really complicated from the Word of God, then you can almost always discount it. Someone say, well, what about the Trinity? Trinity is simple unless you think too much about it. <laughs> the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Ghost is God. There, but there's not three gods. There's one God and three persons. End of discussion. Now, if you want to talk about all the crazy questions that come up, that can go on for... Well, it has gone on for 2,000 years. But the truth of the Trinity is very simple. And that's the way Bible teaching is. So we begin with, uh, by noting the bride, and this is not Israel. Why do we say that? Because some people teach that it is. And the Spirit and the bride say come. So if you're going to teach that the bride is anything other than the believers, the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, then you have to fill in the blank by saying, okay, and we say that's Israel. A group called hyper-dispensationalists teach the error that the bride is Israel. And the Spirit and Israel say come. <laughs> Just think about how dumb that sounds. Why? That's not Israel. Israel isn't about calling on people to come. Right now Israel is blinded. <laughs> yeah. Think about how insane it is to teach that this is... Israel, the church is calling the world to Christ, not Israel. And so that's one of the things about Bible teaching again is, you know, just sometimes if you just say what you believe out loud, then it'll kind of wake you up to how stupid it is. I mean, if it's, her it's heresy, it's error, you know. I mean, I can't imagine being a, a Mormon, you know, and sitting around saying, wow, our God was once a man. And his 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 God was once a man. 
And you say, how long are you going to do that? You'd have to do it forever. At some point, there had to be a God that is not created and didn't become a God from being a man. It's like the Big Bang Theory. Once upon a time, there was nothing, and it exploded. <laughs> what exploded? Nothing. <laughs> Just saying things out loud sometimes, you realize how dumb it is. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Uh, other hyper-dispensationalists teach the error that the bride is New Jerusalem. Well, that don't fit. Do cities talk? But New Jerusalem is the mother of us all. Now, mothers talk. <laughs> but that's not who's talking in this passage. Reminder from Galatians 4.26, we read this a few weeks ago, but Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. That's an amazing thing, but I can't get into all this except for to say that obviously... New Jerusalem is the mother, not the bride. Amen? That's right. Error begets error. Mm -hmm. That'd make a good t shirt. <laughs> uh, also, you say heresy begets heresy. But once you start wrongly dividing the word of truth, you go off the rails. That's. Something you, you got to be careful because once they hook you into something, and I've had half dozen people just this year so far who had blew me off, disfriend me, unfriend me, whatever you call it, and hadn't heard from some of them in months. And they come back and they say, You know, you were right about that guy. You were right about dispensations. You were right about. No, I wasn't right. I'm glad I gave you truthful information, but I'm not the one that's right. It's right. The, the Word of God is right. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. If you ignore the context, you don't put things where they belong, you're going to go off the rails. Wrongly dividing. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, what, read this, and let him that heareth say, come. You ever think about what that means? That's you and me. See? The Spirit and the Bride say, come. That's kind of a collective of the Holy Spirit who dwells all believers. The Bride is the representation of all believers. But now it's down to the brass tacks. This is personal. Yeah, there's some people say, well, those preachers and those men at church, they'll do the work, uh, you know, I'm... Um, I've got my own gifts. I've got my own callings. You know, that sort of thing. And the Bible says if you're a child of God, you heard the gospel somehow. You heard a preacher. You heard a friend. You heard a complete stranger. It doesn't matter. You got a gospel tract. However, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now turn it around. And I love to use old Woody Hayes who said, pay it forward. Well, that's not just when someone buys you a cookie or changes your tire when you have a flat tire. Those are great. That's great. If someone does something for you, that ought to drive you to say, you know what, I'm going to do something for somebody else. But it ought to start with the fact that Jesus died for you and someone else told you the gospel. Now you turn around and give your life up and preach the gospel. Amen? Amen. You heard and took heed then call on others. And the Spirit of the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come. That's what, we, that's what we're to do. And, read that, and let him that is a thirst come. That would be those who need to come. Yet. Haven't come yet. And you can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Yep. Some of you may not know that. I didn't come up with that. That's, that's not with me. That's been around for a while. It's an old saying. <laughs> Hello. I'm Mr. Ed. I put that in there for no reason. <laughs> I just love Mr. Ed. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now look close at that. 
First of all, it's funny how many times these liberals love to go back to Matthew 5 and try to throw it in your face if you're not, you know, sweet and nice all the time. If you ever tell them they're sinners, you tell them they're lost, tell them that the lost go to hell, you're mean. You need to go back and read Matthew 5. Amen. <laughs> yeah, don't throw your fake Jesus in my face. But... This isn't actually even talking to Christians at this. He's, he's saying, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Christians, you're already full of the Holy Spirit. And if you're not full enough, that's your fault. God's there ready to fill you, but as long as you are in charge and you resist giving up to the Lord, then you won't be as full as you ought to be. But there under conviction. It's been compared to someone who's in a desert. I remember when I needed saved and the Holy Spirit was convicting me of my need. I wanted to know more. I wanted to understand. I hungered. I thirsted. That was the Holy Spirit drawing me. See? And there are a lot of it, hopefully everybody in this room, if you're saved, you experienced that. There was a time when the Holy Spirit's drawing you're like, what? Wait. I mean, I, she won't mind me saying this, she shared it recently, but when Charlie, you know, uh, was missionary dating over here, <laughs> and he meets this real pretty girl, and well, are you a Christian? Well, yeah, I celebrate Christmas. No, that, you're, that, was, that wasn't you that said that. Was he presents the gospel, and Olivia says, I never really heard that before. I, and what, what happened? She hungered and thirsted for more. She wanted to know. What, wait a minute. What's going on here? And she got her answer. Amen. And that's what happened to everybody if you're saved. I mean, at some point the Holy Spirit has drawn you and you hungered and thirsted. And Jesus promises if you're watching this, listen to this, and you're not saved, but you are interested. You, you feel a drawing. The Holy Spirit is pulling you. And you say, wait, I want to know more about this. If you will, He will. Amen. Amen. And that's where we come to the end of the verse. Verse 17. Read the whole thing with me and pay attention where we pick up here with the word whosoever. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Now, that's simply saying that if you have been preordained and are elect, then you will come. You can't help but come. It's this theological truth called unconditional election and irresistible grace. You just will. That's what you hear if you go to a Calvinist church. It's called baloney. <laughs> Whosoever. Let's just go to this simple verse of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now here's where I said, if you just say what you believe out loud, hey folks, if I believed Calvinism, I wouldn't hesitate to say this. I've met a couple who really believe. They're true believers when it comes to Calvinism. And they'll tell you right up front that really this John 3.16-ish rendition is really what it uh, should say, but it doesn't say. For God so loved the elect that He gave His only begotten Son so that the elect would be forced to believe in Him and have everlasting life. That's the Calvinist teaching. Now they do not, in all fairness, they do not change the Bible and they don't tell you they, you should change the Bible, but then when they preach, they change it. And they hack and hack and hack. And if they were honest, that's how they would, at least they would say, no, to paraphrase it, for God so loved the elect. And it doesn't say that. Whosoever, according to Webster's 1828 Dictionary, is anyone, any person, whatever. <laughs> they say it's the well-ordered cosmos. Yes. That's how they render that. Yes. She's speaking from experience. I know. I, said, I, I know what they say. <laughs> and they'll say the whosoever is the elect. 
And see, there's a half truth there. It's half. It's true that whosoever, when they will, they are the elect. God chose to save those who believe. See that? God chose to save those who believe. So who are the chosen? The whosoever. That's who's saved. They have to redefine words, and that's what all the cults do, folks. You want to know why Baptist churches, for example, are, have been split by Calvinism. Calvinists come in and they split churches. Um, Calvinists, usually it's a pastor or, a, or someone in leadership, and they come in and they start packing the leadership, and they start kicking out people who don't believe what they believe, and eventually they then change the statements of faith. And that you'll, you'll find that you can go to these churches that are Calvinistic who are, used to be, you know, just like have the same state of faith, faith that we have. And you'll find that the history is some parasite came in and sucked the life out of that church and converted it over to a Calvinist church. Yep. Now, the whosoever, according to the English language, the King James Bible is translated in, is anyone, not the elect. It's any person, whatever. Any person, whatever, can believe and be saved. Isn't that simple? They even quote the same verse when they give you... That's in the dictionary. Whosoever will. Who's, who's whosoever? Anyone. Any person, whatever. Let him take of the water of life freely. Now, whosoever means what? It means whosoever. <laughs> See how simple it is? It takes a Calvinist to make that difficult. Mm -hmm. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever what? Will. will. Let him take the water of life freely. Well, let's go back to Webster and see what he says about will. Will is a dude that I went to school with. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> will is the that faculty of the mind by which we determine either to do or forbear an action. See how simple that is? The faculty of the mind by which we determine whether or not to do something. If you don't make that determination, it's not will. Calvinists teach that you don't will anything when it comes to salvation you do what you are predestined, predetermined, and forced to do. But the double talking, split tongue preachers that speak with four tongue will get up there and act like they believe in a will and then preach whole message, messages denying it. Now, another reason, another way you can tell that you're in a, either a cult or a cultic or very unsound church is when the guy gets up and preaches the same thing over and over. We've talked about uh, our experience in the apostolic Pentecostal movement. The majority of sermons will be about the trinities of the devil. You must be baptized in the name of Jesus only and speak in tongues to be saved. Put dresses on and quit wearing pants and makeup. And Guys, use, in some of those churches, a lot of them anyway, you, Jim, your back's lit and you need sleeves. And get rid of the facial hair. And do you have socks on? Okay. That's what you get in these churches. <laughs> and by the way, the Abstocks believe in the same type of thing the Calvinists do. They preach everything's predetermined. And a lot of them base it on that we talked about before, not picking on anybody, but that Cain serpent seed doctrine. William Branham.